Hello and welcome back health communication peeps. Today we're going to be talking about chapter 9 which focuses on risk and crisis communication. Um, hopefully by the end of today's little summary lecture you'll have a pretty good idea about what those two different fields um, are concerned themselves with and um, what the difference is between them and you'll also be able to give maybe a couple of examples of ways that um, practitioners or researchers in um, risk and uh, crisis communication um, might actually apply their skills. So um, let's go ahead and start with I'd say kind of the basic difference, at least as far as I see it, between risk and crisis communication, what that is. Um, I think the best way to think about this is risk communication is concerned with hazards or threats, um, bad things that could happen to people, things that we don't want, right, that haven't necessarily happened yet, um, meaning they've happened to some, but the idea is, is that if people are at risk to something, if, if, if um, a certain population is, is at risk for something, um, then there's still sort of time to avoid that risk, right? So you could look at um, risk communication as being concerned a lot with prevention. Um, crisis communication, on the other t hand, um, is the study of how we communicate when a crisis has actually happened, when a terrorist attack has happened, when a, um, a hurricane has happened, or um, even maybe a pandemic, right? Something that was not necessarily expected. Maybe we knew it was possible, maybe we've always known there was a risk for it, right? And we've had risk communication about it in the past. But until it actually happens, um, we don't activate sort of, we don't go into <laughs> literally crisis mode, okay? So again, one of them is sort of um, before an event happens, and then one of them is in response to an unexpected, um, an unexpected event. But hopefully, hopefully you can already see the connections here, or why your book would want to put these two different things in the same chapter. Um, I think that right risk communication is all about, in in many ways, uh, preventing different types of crises. Um, although uh, they, some events obviously in life are much more expected than others. Um, okay, so let's talk about some specific examples here. Um, I was just jotting these down before I turned on my camera. Um, I think the best way to sort of sum up, you know, um, risk communication is to look at two different functions. Um, and I'm definitely oversimplifying it, but I'm oversimplifying it in a way that hopefully it'll make it very clear. Um, the first um, the first thing I like to think about is, is people who study risk communication or are concerned with risk communication are concerned with identifying risks and not just identifying them but trying to figure out how severe they are. How likely is a risk, um, how likely is a risk actually to become not just a risk but some sort of crisis or something that actually happens. Um, so an example of this would be um, like epidemiologists that are trying to figure out right uh, who's at risk for certain types of diseases. Um, who's at risk for becoming obese. Um, maybe there are genetic factors that they look at or social factors, right? Um, we've talked before about how social norms are so important and people's behaviors and um, that could be a risk factor, right? That makes people more susceptible to um, heart disease or um, skin cancer, whatever the case is, right? So we're concerned about actually identifying what the risks are. Um, but the second component and definitely the component I'm more interested in um, in my own research is the social influence um, side of risk communication, which is actually trying to figure out how the public makes sense of their own risk, um, or how to persuade people um, that they are at risk for something in a way that that, that will um, persuade them to change their behaviors um, and maybe reduce their risk. Um, so um, an, a great example um, that I was thinking about the other day, um, in another one of my classes we were talking about the breast cancer awareness campaign. And I, I'm sure you guys are all very familiar, right, with the pink ribbons, the pink Kentucky Fried Chicken buckets. I mean, that just floored me. Um, the pink everything, right? Breast cancer awareness, has, um, the Susan B. Coleman uh, Foundation has been very successful with that campaign and getting um, different types of uh, corporate partnerships and things like that for it. Um, and people recognize that campaign. Um, well, one of the more interesting sort of negative repercussions of it, and I'm not saying it's bad, but one of the things that you hear come up a lot is that um, it tends to make people overestimate their risk of breast cancer. Now you could say, well, what's the problem with that? And I would have to agree, better safe than sorry, right? Um, in most cases, right? It encourages people to maybe get annual mam mammograms and do all types of things that um, are good for reducing their risk of uh, dying from breast cancer. 
Well, the downside is this. Um, when you actually give people surveys to, to ask them um, about their perception of what they're uh, most at risk for, um, women in particular, they tend to rate breast cancer very highly, but they rate heart disease uh, very low that, compared to breast cancer. So they actually don't think that there is much of risk of dying of heart disease or uh, suffering from heart disease as they are breast cancer. The problem with that is that that doesn't actually match the reality. That doesn't actually match what people are at risk for. So a risk communication topic might not necessarily be how do we decrease people's awareness of breast cancer, but it might be about how do we raise awareness about the people's risk for heart disease, right? Um, sort of competing with that perception in your mind of uh, what's the most salient risk in your mind, right? What's the thing that um, you're thinking about um, in a way that, again, helps people conceptualize their own risks in a way that matches reality. Um, so that's just another example. Another interesting area I was thinking about is, um, you know, different factors could affect people's uh, perception of risk um, and health communication researchers and practitioners are often very concerned with um, trying to reach particular populations to again influence um, how susceptible um, they feel uh, for different types of risks and uh, young adults are always a um, in the journals I read young adults are always a popular group to talk about because uh, it's hard to influence teenagers' perception of risk in general. Um, teenagers tend to um, feel like they're a little bit more immune to different types of hazards or um, right, they have like low mortality salience, their death isn't really on the top of their mind. <laughs> so it's harder to convince them of risk. So um, a health communication researcher would look at different types of message design, uh, design strategies that could be targeted specifically at um, a population that maybe needs a little boost in their perception of risk. Another great example that I think we've talked about before um, is older adults. And older adults tend to have very low risk perceptions um, when it comes to uh, STDs like HIV and AIDS, um, herpes, whatever, because, right, um, they are not uh, traditionally used to thinking about those things as being applicable to them. Um, however, uh, as more and more people become older adults and get into the dating pool, right, we're seeing this increase um, in the transmission of STDs among older adults. And yet, once again, we have this problem in um, risk communication where older adults' perception of their risk doesn't actually match the reality. So again, there's lots of efforts um, out there right now trying to reconcile that. Um, okay, um, so that is sort of an overview of risk communication. Um, crisis communication, I will say this, it's a little less theoretical, right? It's not, there's not a lot of um, message targeting going on and trying to figure out, right, the theories that would motivate different people's perceptions of risk and everything. But if you think about it, there's good reason for that, right? Because it's it's kind of a fly by your seat of the, uh, by the seat of your pants um, area, right? Uh, if a crisis is unexpected, it's much harder to respond to than a very well-researched, for instance, campaign designed at um, raising people's awareness about certain uh, risks uh, that might be relevant to them. Um, so um, there was, though, I thought this was great. Your book did outline these um, four crisis management steps. Um, and I think you will see some overlap there. Um, a crisis management plan, right? If somebody's trying to outline what are we going to do if a crisis happens, if a hurricane happens, if this type of terrorist attack happens in this area, right? There's all these like what ifs, but we can still do a little planning ahead. Um, and the crisis management steps that your book outlined are fourfold. Um, the first is prevention, which if you ask me, prevention sounds a lot like risk communication to me, right? Um, now certainly it, it, risk communication, right? We, if, if we're concerned about a terrorist attack, um, there's not going to be a campaign out there to um, to persuade people about their risk of a terrorist attack. I don't think that would do much good. Um, however, um, certainly part of crisis management would be trying as hard as possible to prevent bad things from happening to begin with. Fair enough. Um, but hence the name crisis, that doesn't always work. Um, so it's always good to also go to this next step, which is um, preparation. This is where you're practicing um, for different types of outcomes. Uh, I. <laughs> I'm not embarrassed to say it. I mean, it's just, it's a sad thing to say. Um, a little while ago, I went with some other faculty members to a uh, sort of a clinic uh, that was 
trying to tell us what to do if there's an active shooter on campus. Um, it was just a little clinic. We watched a video. A police officer came and told us about different strategies for evacuating classrooms and stuff, right? Kind of scary stuff. But the whole idea is that um, if we have gone through that type of, well, you could call it training, um, I don't know if it was really training, that informational session that should a crisis actually happen. They're not actually talking about our risk for it being very high. In fact, they said our risk was very low, but should it happen because we've been through this informational session, we'll be able to respond much better. Um, I've also uh, mock drills on campus, not this campus, but other campuses I've seen where um, the police will also run through these things, right? Crisis, um, management is very important for first responders. Um, so they might run through a lot of drills and that would all be considered preparation um, for the event of a disaster. Um, then of course there's response, which is actually whatever happens during the response. Um, I think we're better at remembering bad crisis responses than we are good crisis responses. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm from Atlanta originally and so I was following the snowpocalypse um, which is essentially a sheet of ice that came and shut down the city of Atlanta. And I take it very personally when people make fun of Southerners, because really we don't have ice or snow plows or anything like that. So when we have, uh, you know, a freezing, it's kind of a big deal. It can turn into a crisis very quickly. And, and during the snowpocalypse in January of, I guess, 2013, um, I would say that the response was terrible. They let people out of work all at the same time. You know, the city sort of made this decision that, oh, there's going to be a problem. And then they put everybody on the roads at the same time and people were stranded. And it was a, it was a terrible crisis response. Um, but that's really what happened um, in the moment, right? So the actual response. Um, and then um, learning is the final step. <laughs> what have we learned today, right? I think the governor of Georgia learned a lot that time. But really, I mean, crisis management teams, teams um, are assembled all the time, particularly um, within, again, first responding organizations, and the government, right? Um, this is a whole branch of health communication. And a big part of that is just assessing other types of responses that have come beforehand so that in the next crisis or in the next thing that happens similarly, uh, we can have an improved response, right? Maybe developing other different preps and things like that. Um, Anyway, I, I think that pretty much covers it. Um, again, I, I think that if you can um, sort of distinguish between risk and um, if you can distinguish between risk and crisis communication and maybe give some examples of how those things apply, I think you're in pretty good shape. So thank you. See you next time.